prophets are teachers. They repeat and teach that which they have been taught. And like all good teachers, they repeat their message again and again to be sure that the church does not miss any point of the truth that has been entrusted to them. The greatest prophet of the Old Testament says this, Moses, and the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that ye might do them in the land whither ye go over to possess it. Moses said that was his work, to teach the children of Israel. And like all good teachers, he repeated instruction again and again. There was a famous normal school in the state of Kansas once that had inscribed on the front of the building, review, and then review again, and review all that you've reviewed. It is a law of the human mind that we need review. We need drill. We need truth to be repeated. Now, at one time, Sister White chose Peter's ladder. You know it is found in the first chapter of Second Peter, beginning, add to your faith, virtue, and so on. It's called Peter's ladder. It ends with charity or love at the top, the top round. It begins with faith, but the top round is love. She spoke on this many times, and one of our old ministers seemed to get weary of it. And he was very bold. He said to her one day, Sister White, why do you preach on Peter's ladder all the time? I'd like to hear a new subject. And she looked at him. She looked at him very straight. And she said, My brother, have you reached the top round? That was love. Now this poor dear brother was, some people thought, was a bit lacking in charity. His head went down and he said, No, Sister White. Well, then I must continue to preach on Peter's ladder. <clears throat> As I said, a prophet repeats the lessons he has taught. Now, you know, one of the earliest messages that came to this people was concerning helpful living. And Sister White often repeated her the principles of healthful living. And one of them is the need that we have for fresh air. Now I suppose that at this time and this period of history, we may not possibly need that lesson so much. Though last week the reason I grew so weary toward the end of my talk was because I needed some fresh air. The moment I stepped outside, I was all right. You know, when the room is full of people, we use up all the oxygen in a short time. And some of us are so constituted that unless we have an abundance of fresh air, we grow rather faint. <clears throat> she gave us a lesson in the Healdsburg Church once that I've never forgotten. minutes. She said, uh, brethren, the air in this room is not very fresh. I think you had better open the windows on this side of the church. The deacons obediently got up and opened the windows. Now that year we'd had a number in the church who heated their homes uh, beyond uh, comparison. So when they came to church, they couldn't bear to have the windows open because 
they said they were sure they would take their death of cold. So all the windows, one by one, had been closed. And now Sister White asked that they be opened on this side of the church, and they were opened. I saw callers come up. She went on for a few minutes, and she said, "Uh, Brethren, this air is not good yet. Will you please open the windows on this side? And they were opened. She proceeded for some time, and then she said, I think that we could think a little better if the door was opened there. And the door was opened. Now there was another door just behind the pulpit. And a little later she asked that that be opened. And so before she finished, every window and every door in that auditorium was open. And do you know, strange as it may seem, I inquired carefully. Not a single person in the service that day caught cold. Neither did anybody go to sleep. (laughs) Now this is one of the principles that she taught to everyone, particularly to our ministers and other public speakers. And that is how to breathe. Oh, you say, teach us how to breathe? Why, we all know how to breathe. Are you sure? She said there were very few people that breathe properly and that the youth particularly should be taught to breathe properly, and how to read and to speak in such a way that no unnatural strain should come on the throat and lungs, but that the work should be shared by the abdominal muscles. And that was a new principle. She sometimes at general meetings took the ministers aside and gave them lessons, teaching them how to breathe. She said, most of us never fill the lungs completely. That our breathing is only the upper chest breathing. And that for years, The entire lung space is never filled. Well, that was astonishing. I wondered about it. Speaking from the throat, letting the sound come from the upper part of the vocal organs, impairs the health of those organs and decreases their efficiency. I remember several of our elder ministers who are in good health that she told them that if they would learn to breathe properly, they wouldn't need to retire, but that they might preach this blessed truth for many years to come if they would only learn to breathe properly. She also taught that our clothing should be loose enough that we might be able to breathe and to breathe to the very depths of our lungs. Now today, you may say, well, I don't understand that. Our clothing is so loose, any of us can breathe. But it wasn't so in her day. In her day, no woman could take a deep breath if she was properly attired, as was considered proper in those days. For the corset that was worn made it impossible for any woman to take a deep breath. She could breathe only from the upper part of her lungs. And you know that even physicians taught that women naturally breathe differently from men. That they breathe naturally only from the upper part of the chest. Well, Dr. Kellogg said, it is not true. 
women naturally, if they were dressed properly, would uh, breathe just as men do. And there was quite a discussion in the medical world about it. And so to prove his principle, he went down into lower Mexico to the Kaipas Indians, those among whom Dr. Butler and Dr. Comstock are working today. Their women had never worn any tight clothing. And by bribing the chiefs, got permission to examine those women and brought back the proof that they breathed just like men, that they breathed to the very depths of their lungs. Of course, they weren't hampered. They didn't wear any tight clothing, and they could breathe that way, and they'd always breathe that way. And so on the march, they marched just along just the same as the men did, only they carried all the household utensils and sometimes the wigwam while the men walked without them. And Dr. Kellogg came back with the proof. Many have died who might have lived had they been taught how to use the voice correctly. The right use of the abdominal muscles in reading and speaking will prove a remedy for many voice and chest difficulties and the means of prolonging life. Now there were some of our ministers who lived much longer than they would have lived because she taught them how to breathe. And Dr. Kellogg himself owed his life to her. One day in Battle Creek at church, she noticed a little boy about 10 years old in the audience a little pale-faced boy with round shoulders and a sunken chest. When she got home, she said to her husband, James, did you notice that little boy in church today, that pale little fellow? I felt so sorry for him. He must be ill, and he looked so sad. Well, he said, that's little Johnny Kellogg. His mother died recently of consumption. That's what we used to call tuberculosis, consumption. And several of his aunties have died. In fact, the disease seems to be in the family. And that little boy evidently has it, or else he's near to having it. James, she said, do you think that his uh, uh, father would permit him to come and call upon me? I'd like to talk with that little boy. And uh, so the next day, little Johnny Kellogg came. And she said, Johnny, uh, you don't feel very strong, do you? No, he said he didn't. He didn't, feel, he didn't feel right at all. Well, she said, I tell you, Johnny, every day I go out of doors in the backyard and take breathing exercises. I wonder if you wouldn't like to come with me and have some, and learn to breathe. You know, I think you could get well. I think you could be well and strong like the other boys if you learned how to breathe. So they went into the backyard and she taught him how to breathe, to breathe deep. And they swung their arms and they exercised and uh, Johnny straightened up and said he felt better. She said, you come tomorrow and have exercises with me. And so she continued that, and Johnny began to be a different boy, but she had some questions about his diet, so she asked his father if he might come and board with her for a while. So she took him into her home and gave him the proper food. Now, any of you that knew Dr. Kellogg you remember, he was a short man with a very large chest, almost out of proportion to his body. But do you know, that chest and those lungs kept him alive into the 90s, whereas he would have died in his teens. And we never should have known of the wonderful work that Dr. Kellogg did in teaching the principles 
of helpful living. <clears throat> Dr. Kellogg told uh, my brother that story himself, and he said, I owe my life to the things that she taught me. So she taught the Hillsburg Church to have fresh air in the church. Also one day, when she stood up to speak, the front seats were vacant. She looked down at them. Then she said, Brethren, why did you come here today? Do you want the message that God has given me for you? And they all nodded. Oh, yes, indeed. Well, she said, then why do you leave the front seats vacant? Do you know that evil angels come to church as well as the good angels? And if you don't occupy them, they occupy the front seats. And there's plenty of room for them today to catch away the message that God has given me for you. Well, you should have seen those front seats fill up. And the lesson wasn't forgotten for a long time. Some have asked, wasn't Sister White very severe if a person made a mistake? Well, I was told a story that illustrates her attitude and her words when a person made a mistake. As you may know, after her husband died, her friends and relatives had a little con consultation together and they decided that Sister White should have someone now to travel with her always. And they thought it would be best to select a nurse, also a person who had good uh, executive ability and would want, know what to do uh, for her comfort and convenience, especially when she traveled. And so they went to her and talked to her about it, and finally she was persuaded that that would be the best thing. So they said, now, Sister White, whom do you think you would like to have to live with you, be with you always, take care of you, and especially to help you when you travel? She asked for time to think it over, and finally she told them, I think I should like Miss Sarah McInturfer. Now, Miss Sarah at this time, though she was a nurse, was working in the bindery of the Review and Herald. And when the message came to her, uh, the foreman came to her and said, uh, you may be excused for the rest of the afternoon. Sister White has sent for you. Oh, she thought. I wonder what, I, what I've done wrong. But Sister White had sent for her, so she went all trembling over to her home. And when she went in, Sister White came to the door and met her, met her so kindly and so cordially, and brought her to a seat beside her. Then she said, My dear Sarah, how would you like to come and live with me and be the com my companion the rest of my life? Well, this was so different from what Sister Sarah had thought that she couldn't speak for a moment. Sister White had chosen her to go with her, to be with her day and night and all the time as long as she should live. What a responsibility and what an honor. So she became her private nurse and secretary and went with her everywhere never left her to the last day that she lived now one time when they were living in Healdsburg they went down to camp meeting at Oakland 
And as I said the other evening, there was two acres of orchard around the home in, in Healdsburg. And uh, a friend came down in the middle of the camp meeting and said to Sister White, they, uh, there's been some very warm weather in Healdsburg and the peaches uh, on your, in your orchard are falling to the ground. They're all ripe and they're going to be ruined before you come home if something isn't done with them. Well, she had a number of her secretaries with her beside Miss McIntyre, and the cook was along. Well, the cook said, I'll go home and uh, can the peaches. Oh, no, Miss McIntyre said, let me go. You have to cook and cook all the time, and it isn't often that you get out like this. This is your vacation. I will go back to home and can the peaches. And she did. She came home, and in that big house all by herself, and in that kitchen, which could get so hot on canning days, I know, for afterward I canned in that kitchen. She canned peaches. And peaches, and peaches, and peaches. Then she carried them down into the cellar and put them all away in shining rows. Oh, they look so beautiful, you know, <laughs> when you get them done. And you forget how tired you were and how warm it was. Well, then the family came home, and oh, they thanked her over and over and said she was so unselfish to leave the meeting and be willing to come home and can the peaches. And, uh, and Sister White was very, very grateful. Well, several days went by, and then one day they heard some strange sounds out of the cellar, kind of shh. And when they ventured down there, there was peaches all over the cellar. What had gone wrong? Well, it was in the days when the lid and the rubber were separate. You know, the manufacturers found out that people sometimes made mistakes about this matter, so they put them together so that we can't make a mistake now. Well, the cook had forgotten to tell Miss McInturfer that there were rubber rings that must be put on before the lid was put on. Now, she'd never bottled peaches before. She was English, and she said bottled. And she, she told me about it. She said I'd never bottled peaches before, and I put on the lids, and I screwed them down tight, and I thought that was all there was to it. But it wasn't. <laughs> she'd left off the rings. Oh, and every can was burst. There was broken glass and peaches over everything. Oh, she said, what will Mother say? She called Sister White Mother. What will Mother say? But she marched valiantly upstairs to tell her. She told her what had happened. And this is what Sister White said. Sarah, dear, experience is a hard teacher but you'll never forget her lessons. And that's all she said. That was one of Sister White's harsh rebukes. And Mrs. Chrysler, who lived in her family for many years, said there never was a kinder person in this world than our dear mother. You know, among themselves, they called her mother and loved her dearly. <coughs> Well, finally, there came a, a request from far away Australia that Sister White should come over there and help them there. They were struggling. They were new churches, new in the faith, and they felt that somehow that we in America were enjoying blessings and benefits that had been denied to them, that is, her personal presence. And so she packed up and went to Australia in 1891, and she was there until 1900. When she went away, what do you think she did with her home? There was a brother in the Healdsburg Church that had once been what was in those days considered a wealthy man. He had been a cattleman up in the Dakotas. 
But when he learned this faith, he sold his uh, ranch and his cattle, came to Healdsburg, put his children in the school. Now he was so generous, and his wife was more so, that little by little he gave away nearly all the money that he had. He just poured it out. In those days, I never went to camp meeting that there wasn't a plea made for money for Healdsburg College and the Pacific Press, if you will believe it. They were always in debt. You know, money was very scarce, and most of our people were poor. Well, dear Brother Leininger always came up with some money. Well, the time came when he had exhausted his fortune. So Sister White invited him to live in her home while she was gone to Australia. And they lived there the nine years that she was gone. Before she came back, when the general conference decided it was time for her to come back, they bought a little home for Brother Leininger over near St. Helena and moved him over there just before she returned so that she could come back to her home. She was very surprised when she came and found that he was gone. But she was very happy to think that the conference had recognized his worth and his need. So he had a, a comfortable little home until he died. Now, you know, in those days, there was no provision made for retired workers. That hadn't been thought of yet. It was Elder A.G. Daniels that first proposed a sustentation for our retired workers. Before that, there wasn't any. And sometimes it was very difficult for people who had given their all, even in time or talent or money, to finish out life because there was no old age pension either, nor social security. But Sister White was thinking about it all the time, and she was always inquiring about this one and that one, how they were getting along financially. I know, for she once asked me. Before she went away to uh, Australia, there was a camp meeting held in Healdsburg, out in the edge of Healdsburg, pitched at a camp, and we all went to camp meeting. Now it was a custom in those days that on the last Sunday, you know, camp meeting begins on Thursday evening, and a week from the next Sunday is the last day of camp meeting. Now it was the custom in those days, had been followed for years, that on the last Sunday afternoon, Sister White would speak on the subject of temperance. She pursued this uh, custom for years and years. Now she was going away to Australia, and had been told in the papers. Now at that time, and for all time, I'm glad to say, the people of Healdsburg were always interested in what the Seventh-day Adventists were doing, and very kindly disposed toward our people. So the fact that Sister White, who was uh, Mrs. White, as they said, was a resident of Healdsburg, and she was going to Australia, which in those days was about like going to another planet. It was very unusual and very remarkable. Now, of course, everyone in the city of Healdsburg was invited to attend, and pretty nearly everybody did. Of course, the big tent couldn't hold everyone. It was a warm summer day toward the fall. So they lifted all the tent curtains around, and there were seats outside, but that wasn't enough. And many people sat on the grass or sat in their carriages and listened. You suppose they heard her? Nobody ever missed a syllable of what she said, for she followed out the principle of correct breathing so that everybody heard her far and near. I shall never forget it. I sat in a corner back by one of the tent poles. 
And as I looked out there, it was a beautiful scene. Healdsburg is a beautiful village. When I speak of it, I'm speaking of that spot on the earth that's dearest to my heart. And it was to her. As she proceeded in her talk on temperance, she suddenly stopped and looked out over the landscape. Now, Sonoma County, as you may know, is the greatest wine-producing county in the United States of America. And all the hills, uh, Healdsburg is, is in the hills, it's on rolling land. And all about, on the hills, up and down, were great, beautiful vineyards. And it was near the fall when the fruit was ripe, getting ripe. You know how beautiful the clusters of grapes look. When I came out here to, from Colorado, it was so strange. I used to write back to my mother, and I said, they plow the hills here, they cultivate the hills because they have vineyards on them, and the horses stand on their noses when they plow because they went down and up, you know. And it looked to me as if they were on their noses. But all oh, such wonderful results. There were every hill just crowned with vineyards, beautiful vineyards, and the meadows between, and the Russian River flowing by. Outside the town, on the two roads leading north and northwest, there were great big wineries. And in the town itself, there were 11 saloons. And it wasn't a very large town either. She looked out, looked around. She said, Oh, Healdsburg, Healdsburg, beautiful Healdsburg, how I love you. But the curse of God is on you. You have taken the bounties that heaven gave you the beautiful fruit, and have made of it a poison that destroys both soul and body. The silence could be felt. After a moment she recovered and went on with her appeal to parents for their children that they would teach them the principles of temperance. And then she closed her sermon. And the next day, she went away to Australia. She was gone nine years. Sometimes later than that, I left Australia, uh, Healdsburg. I was gone five years. When I returned, a friend, Miss Amelia Heald. Healdsburg was named for her family. On Sabbath, invited me out for a ride to see my old hometown, as she said. She drove through the town and out toward the west. And I looked about, and I said, Amelia, what? What is the matter with the vineyards? They're all dead. Why, yes, she said, hadn't you heard how the phylloxera got into the grapes, into the vineyards, and has killed every vineyard in this county? Amelia, do you remember what Sister White said in that last sermon here? Why, yes, I do remember it now. She said, the curse of God is on you. And I said, and it is. Every grapevine was dead. Did men learn the lesson? Oh no. Oh no. I don't know. It's so difficult for us to learn, isn't it? Seems as if we can't learn. All the vineyardists got together finally, had a big meeting. And one of them said that he'd heard that over in Italy they had finally been able 
to um, grow a resistant vine, a vine that would resist the disease called phylloxera. And they sent some of their men over to Italy to investigate the matter, and they found it was true that they had a grapevine over there, a wine grape, that would not take phylloxera. So they ordered Oh, an immense quantity of roots. And she said, they're coming. Now in a few weeks, all these vineyards will be torn out and the vines will be burned. The ground uh, will be treated and those resistant vines will be planted here. And that is just what was done. There came out... Uh, some uh, Italians by the name of Asti, and they bought hundreds of... <clears throat> this Asti company went between Healdsburg and Geyserville and bought hundreds of acres of land and planted it with this new resistant root uh, vine and built the largest winery in California. And there it is today. And there it was during Prohibition. My sister at that time, one of my sisters, lived near Geyserville. I was visiting her once during Prohibition. Now you know the government officers came and locked the winery and put the government seal on it. Nobody was ever to open it. And they didn't open it. That remained there all through prohibition. <laughs> but do you know there was a basement? <laughs> there was a basement in that building and it had a secret entrance. Now, of course, I never went down that basement. I don't know what was done there, but I do know this. While I was visiting my sister, I'm not a very good sleeper, and in the night, I heard the creaking of heavy vehicles, and I went to the window, and there were great trucks going slowly by with round objects piled up on them. They looked like barrels. But it was in the dark of the moon, you understand, and I couldn't be sure. I couldn't have sworn that that's what it was. Well, the next day, I said to my sister, I said, what is that that goes by in the night, those great big trucks that looks like barrels on them? <laughs> she said, don't you say that out loud. We couldn't live in this community if we answered your question. I said, what is it? What was it? You know. Well, <clears throat> after nine years, Sister White, as I said, returned to find that she could go back into her home, and she was very glad about that when she found out that Brother Leiniger had been properly cared for. But then her son and other advisors got together again. Now, you may think this is strange, that people uh, advised Sister White, but they did, as they had about her having a uh, Miss McInturfer with her, and now they had some more advice for her. And her son was, Willie White, was foremost in giving the advice. He said, Mother, you're growing older every day, <laughs> just as if he weren't, and uh, you often need medical attention. Now, we didn't have a doctor in every town in those days. And uh, don't you think it would be better for you to live over near the sanitarium than here? Now, it's 35 miles from the sanitarium to Healdsburg. And in those days, that was a long way. That was a long way. And... Uh, all your friends here, the president of the conference and others, think that it would be much better 
if you left this home here and had a home over near sanitarium. Suppose we sell this home and uh, buy one over there. Oh, Willie, she said, seems as if I could never sell this home. She told me afterward privately that she loved that home in Healdsburg more than any other place she'd ever lived. But they persuaded her finally. You know what I found out about Sister White? That when it was a matter of her own pleasure and convenience, she always gave up. But if it was a matter of right and wrong, never. You couldn't move her any more than you could move Gibraltar on a matter that might affect you, your salvation. But her own pleasure, her own convenience, if others thought she should do this or that, she consented. And so she left this home that she loved so much and went to Elmshaven. And there she lived the last years of her life. Now at this time, as I said, I was back in Healdsburg, and I, my mother came to me, bringing my little brother, and grandma came. And we were living in three of the tiniest little rooms in a very noisy apartment house. And I heard that Sister White's house was for rent. And I rented it. That great big house of six bedrooms she was renting for and two, two acres of orchard and one acre of pleasure grounds, three acres of land, that house for eight dollars a month. If there'd been any more than that, of course I couldn't have I couldn't have rented it because my salary at that time was thirty dollars a month. And you know the economists tell us that we shouldn't pay for our housing more than one-fourth of our income. Well, that's a little more than one-fourth, isn't it? But part of the time I rented out two rooms. So, uh, so I moved to the big house. And weren't we happy there? I love big things. I suppose all small people do it kind of compensates, you know, for their lack of stature. <laughs> Oh, there was room. <laughs> there was room in the house and out of it. Well, Sister White often visited Healdsburg. She'd come over and speak in the church, stay overnight, and Sunday morning, I knew that she'd come to call. She didn't fail. She called every Sunday morning after she'd preached on Sabbath. The first time she came, she said to me, I think I'd like to go out to the orchard now. After I rented the place, she wouldn't have thought of going to the orchard without asking my permission. No, indeed. So I went out with her. And you know, she was a little stout woman like me. But you know, she had a step as light as a bird's. She stepped from the one furrow to another in that, just, just like that. I used to look at her and wonder how she could. And you know, now this may seem foolish to you, but it seemed to me that she was so drawn toward heaven that her feet just barely touched the earth. Just a fancy of mine, perhaps, but I couldn't help but think of it. And you know, she knew every tree there, what kind of tree it was, there were several different varieties of peaches, and she knew one from another. And the plum trees, and the pear trees, and there were some she recommended to me particularly. I know there was one peach tree. She said, now, uh, the fruit from these trees I sold to the cannery. It just paid for plowing the orchard. But she said, now, now don't let them have this tree, this particular, because it's the very finest peach that I've ever tasted anywhere is this peach tree. So I reserved that. In the yard was an old oak tree. She came to that. She tried to put her arms around it. She couldn't quite reach. 
Why, Willie, she said, that was her son, see how this oak tree has grown since we went to Australia. Why, when I went, she says, when I planted it here, I could put my, I could circle it, uh, circle it with my hands, and now I can't circle it with my arms. It's grown wonderfully. But underneath it was a great pile of brown needles. She looked at them. Then she turned to me. She said, Sister McKibben, we'll never see anything like that in the new earth. Nothing will ever die there. We'll never see a faded leaf there. For there is life. Life and no death forever. I've never forgotten it. I wish I could say it as she said it. You didn't forget what she said. Ever forget what she said. The next time she came, uh, she seemed a little, uh, just a little bit embarrassed to ask me. She said, uh, Sister McKibben, uh, I, I just love this whole place so much that uh, I've been thinking about it and I would just love uh, to go all over the house once more. Well, I said, certainly, Sister White. You shall go over all the house. I said, shall we go upstairs or downstairs first? Well, she said, we're downstairs. Let's look through the rooms here. So I took her through the rooms. In one room lay my mother. In the other bedroom lay my grandmother. She spoke to them so kindly and so encouragingly. Then we went through the sitting room, the dining room, the kitchen, and out into the laundry room. And I said, uh, Sister White, you remember that here is the bathroom. And I wish you could have heard her laugh. Yes, she says, the bathroom way out here. But really, after all, it was a wonderful blessing. Yes, I said it was. It has been to me, too. Though I said, it's not of much use if you forget to put the wash boiler on in time to heat the water for it. And then she laughed again. Then we went upstairs. As she came to the stairway, she said, Why, you put a handrail on here. What a convenience. I should have had that when I was here. Why, this is a wonderful help. I put a handrail on it because at one time, Elder Brown had lived in two of the rooms and one upstairs, and he was a cripple, and this handrail had been put on to help him up and down the stairs. Oh, she said, this was a wonderful help. I wonder why I didn't have this when I was here. Well, we got to the top of the stairs and I opened the door at the right-hand side. And I said, uh, Sister White, uh, this is my room. Oh, she said, is it? It was my room when I lived here. And you have your desk just where I had mine. The light is so good back in that corner, she said. There was a window on this side, a window on that side. She went over to the desk and leaned on it. Finally, she looked up and she said, It is here that I finished Patriarchs and Prophets. Oh, I said, Did you, Sister White? That's a very favorite book of mine, but it'll be more precious to me now since I know that you wrote a part of it in this room. She turned around. There was a fireplace in the room. The only luxury that I ever knew that Sister White allowed herself was a fireplace. And she said, uh, she saw there was no ashes in it. She said, do you use the fireplace? I said, no, Sister White, I, I am too poor. I can't afford it. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you can't afford to have the fireplace. It's so cheerful. It's so cheerful, she said. It's such a help. 
Then she turned back to the desk and she said, she saw there some manuscript and some signatures. She said, what are you writing? Well, I said, Sister White, you know, and in our church school work is new, and we haven't any Bible lessons for our children in the church school, and I'm trying to write some. I said, they're being printed over at the college press. This is one of the signatures. Oh, she said, why, this is a very important work. Did you say that there's no Bible lessons for the children in the church school? I said, no, uh, except a few that I have written and in my notebook, and the teachers copy them out of my notebook. And, of course, that isn't a very satisfactory way. So Professor Katie has told me that I must, uh, that I must publish them. Now, I said, you know, Sister White, I don't know anything about this matter, but uh, nor how to write books, nor how to publish them. But uh, here is the great need, and nobody else seems to have a burden to write lessons. And she put her hand on my shoulder, and she said, Sister McKibben, in this cause, we all have to do things we don't know how to do. I've been doing them all my life. Things I didn't know how to do. But she said, if you have a willing mind, then God supplies the lack. Wasn't that helpful? Wasn't it encouraging? She picked up a few of the signatures. She said, may I take these with me? I'd like to look them over. So I gave them to her, and she put them in her pocket. Now, where do you suppose was her pocket? Oh, you couldn't guess now. Because women don't have pockets now, except those they carry over their arms. But she had a pocket, and was in her skirt, right in front. And was a good-sized one, too. And she put it in her pocket. Well, now at that time, I didn't tell her. But I was writing lessons on the latter part of the Old Testament, which, if you've ever tried it, is the most difficult part to write upon. And I was greatly concerned about some questions of chronology and other events in the restoration of the Jews when they came back from the Babylonian captivity. But I didn't tell her. But that was what I was wrestling with at that time. Well, do you know, in a few weeks, I received a great big box sent from, by Elder, by Brother Chrysler, Elder C.C. C. Chrysler at that time was the, at the head of her office. Now, why did he send those books to me? He didn't know anything about my uh, difficulties, and I hadn't told her. But when I met him, I said, Brother Chrysler, how did you come to, to send those books to me? They were his books, books that he'd gotten in London. They were the old commentaries of the English divines who studied their Bibles most earnestly. And they were just what I needed. Well, he said, Sister White said that she thought that if I would make up a box of those books that I brought, brought from London, it would help Sister McKibben. And it did. And I hadn't told her anything about my difficulties, nor what I needed. I needed those very books. I had them for about a year before I returned them to Brother Chrysler. Well, we went out of the room to the next room, and she said this was Sarah's room. That was Miss McIntyre's, naturally, next to hers. Then across the hall was the room of Miss Marion Davis. I wish I had an hour to talk about Miss Davis. From all I can learn, now Sister White selected some of the very finest secretaries I think that anybody could have, but there's always one that excels, you know, 
and the one that excelled was Miss Marion Davis. You probably never heard of her. Very few, few people ever did. She was so humble that, and such a tiny little person that you hardly noticed her. But you know that she was the one who gathered together the writings of Sister White when she was compiling her books and put them together. We owe a great deal to Marion Davis, that humble little woman. Any other secretary that Sister White had was better known than Marion Davis on earth. But I think she stood at the head in heaven. Well, this was her room. Then in front, in the front bedroom, was the room of Mrs. L. D. Avery Stuttle. Now sometimes we sing a hymn in church. Oh, for a faith like Enoch of old. Mrs. Stuttle wrote that. She was a poet as well as a very a uh, gifted writer in other things. As we started down the stairs, Sister White seemed to be thinking about that fireplace yet. Her son was standing at the foot, and so she spoke to me very quietly, and she said, Sister McKibben, how are you getting along financially? Now that was a very embarrassing question. When you're working for $30 a month and you have four people to take care of and two of them sick and doctor's bills and so on. Well, I knew, I knew that she didn't have very much of a margin either. So I said, well, I, ma I managed to make ends meet. Well, now, Sister McKibben, if there should come a month uh, when it's very difficult for you, you just write uh, to Brother Chrysler and tell him that this month Sister White said that you weren't to pay the rent. Now, I never had to take advantage of that generous offer. But don't you know it helped me? It helped me wonderfully to know that she cared and that she'd made me that generous offer, eight dollars a month, ninety-six a year. Did she make anything off it? Oh no. Think of her taxes, her insurance. I doubt if it covered it. Well, she smiled. We got down to the door. She passed out, and as she was out at the front gate, there was a very large rose geranium. It seems that she hadn't noticed it before, very particularly. She said, why, Bully, look at that rose geranium. It's grown about like the oak tree. Since, why, she said, you know, I planted that there before I went to Australia. See how it's grown. She turned to me, she said, you know, I love the fragrance of the rose geranium. Would you mind if I took a leaf and was a wrong rose geranium? <laughs> Would you mind if I had a leaf? She didn't take things without asking for them. Well, I said, Sister White, and I went and gathered her a great bouquet of the rose geranium. And she went away with her face buried in the rose geranium. And Miss McIntyre had told me that the next morning when she made up Sister White's bed, she found the rose geranium under her pillow. Well, that's just like you and me, isn't it? Just like you and me. I'm sorry that it's not possible. For me, 
me to convey to you the impression that her life has made upon me. But you will get a great deal of it when you read the testimonies. You'll get a great deal of it. And I want to assure you once more that she lived always what she taught.